So hello again, I am Ketia Velapi, the Assistant Director of Jefferson Chabalala's Kongolose Commanding Commissars. Triple K, directed by 2022 Standard Bank Young Artists for Theatre, the theatre duo. Billy Langa, who is here in spirit, but is physically in Edinburgh, Scotland at the moment. And our own Mashati Mugonyana sitting there in the audience. <laughs> Period. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome you tonight with so much excitement and a deeply rooted gratitude to the celebrated revolutionary scholar and intellectual Dr. Luazi Lushaba's reflective presentation of this work that has actually been homed in this very theatre space for the past few weeks. Dr. Lushaba holds a doctorate degree in the discipline of political studies from the University of Witzwatersrand, right here in Johannesburg. Prior to attending Witz, he graduated from the University of Transkei, now known as the Walter Susulu University, with an honors degree in political studies. Thereafter, he went on to study at Ibadan University in Nigeria and graduated with a master's in philosophy. His five-year sojourn in Nigeria was then followed by two years at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences and Culture in India, where he graduated with a master's in philosophy in subaltern studies. Mr. Lushava, amongst many, many, many other brilliant things that this doctor has done, not only to mention his dedicated devotion to black life, black narrative, black stories, has also written a noteworthy book titled Development as Modernity and Modernity as Development. Additionally, he has also held multiple prestigious visiting fellowships in a number of universities abroad. In 2019, he was the Mandela Visiting Scholar at Harvard University in the United States. He is currently a member of faculty at the University of Cape Town, teaching political studies. And in January of 2024, next year, he will take up an appointment in African Studies at the Northwestern University in Chicago as a visiting professor. We are going to miss you so much, Doctor. <laughs> but we look forward to seeing what more, outside of all of the brilliant things you've done already, is in store for you. So without further ado, I now hand over to the brilliant Dr. Lushaba himself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A very good evening to everyone. As I begin, program director, should we call you Ketia, or chair, or Comrade Kavan? <clears throat> Please allow me to begin first by congratulating the black people who made it through their creative genius, made it possible for us to gather here today. Were it not for the work of cultural production or the work of culturally narrating the nation which is what Congolese commanding commissars does sorry a point was triggered in mind as I as I read that so the work of cultural production or the work of culturally narrating the nation, which is what Congolese commanding commissars does, is one that unfortunately has not commanded the attention and the support both of the state and society generally. And I must state that I'm here not talking of material support. And as we proceed, it will become obvious what kind of support I envisage in mind as I say so. The reason I suspect for this state of affairs is not too hard to fathom. The reason why the work of cultural production has not earned the attention and support of both the state and society generally in South Africa today, I think that reason is not too hard to fathom. 
In societies, particularly post-colonial societies, where freedom or its arrival is midwifed by nationalism, the role of art and, art and cultural production generally is narrowly conceived as but just one avenue for generating one's livelihood. Everywhere in the continent where independence arrives via nationalism, we end up with a very narrow conception of the work of cultural production as but nothing but another avenue for earning a livelihood. Which is basically to say that cultural production and art generally are removed from or precluded from the task of determining societal values. So when we begin to think of art as just but one avenue for earning an employment or earning an upkeep, what we do is to remove art from the task of determining societal values. Just as it is that they are not thought of, the arts and cultural production, just as it is that they are not thought of as a way of telling the continuing history of the nation. Every time you hear the nationalists speak about art, you don't get a sense that they have an appreciation of art and cultural production as a way of telling the continuing history of the nation. Yet again, the arts and work of art cultural production are not thought of as a way of guaranteeing the cultural well-being of a people. In the thinking of art as but an avenue to earn and upkeep we lose the meaning of art and cultural production as a way necessarily of ensuring or guaranteeing the cultural well-being of the people. All of this happens because the post-colonial state run by the nationalist elite, Congo law said to be precise, sees the people as having one existence. And that existence is a material existence, nothing else. So when we exist as material beings, or when people exist only as material beings, their needs, their aspirations, their yearnings can only, it is taught by the nationalist elite and the model of society it institutes, can only be satisfied through material possessions. So when people have this one existence, which is a material existence, the supposition is that their needs, their aspirations, can only be satisfied through material possessions. In this logic, prosperity and societal prosperity means material prosperity. I am certain that I do not need to do much to convince you that the souls of our people, even when they are materially prosperous, the souls of our people in South Africa are culturally empty. Their souls are famished, even when they are fed in their stomachs which is to suggest that it is, not to, it is not enough to sustain people materially. It is not enough to sustain people with food or material possessions when you haven't taken care of their cultural well-being and you haven't taken care of their souls because they are capable of remaining famished even when their stomachs are full. You can only look at the elite in society. Their stomachs are not only full, but big, but they are culturally famished. Their souls are empty. So for societies to prosper, it is not enough 
for them to materially prosper. They have to an equal measure have to attend to their cultural well-being and to their cultural prosperity. For those of us who have had a chance to watch the play Congolese commanding commissars and perhaps to even read the script, and for those of us who are going to watch the play after this talk, what we had or what we will have attended to or satisfied is not observable through the naked eye. What we had or what we will have if we are going to watch the play tonight, what we will have is our cultural well-being enhanced or our souls culturally fed. It is for this reason that Ketia Chair that I wish to thank the noble son of the soil, Jeff Shabalala, for penning this love letter to fellow black people. Love letter. Yes. <laughs> Chair, I also do want to thank most earnestly the director, Masad Mohonyan. And of course, I do want to thank Ketia, the assistant director. Both of them originated the idea of this talk and then took all the necessary steps to bring it to fruition. To both Matlatsi and Ketia, I thank you very much for doing us the honor. <laughs> Lastly, but not least, I wish to thank all of you in the audience for electing to come and fellowship with other black people rather than go attend to the never-ending list of black existential problems. As such, I'm now able to begin my musings with you this afternoon, and the title of my musings is Happily Brief. It is a play on a title of a chapter in Fanon's book. So the title of my musings this afternoon is The Pitfalls of Nationalism. Now earlier, before we began, we had an informal conversation on stage about what Congolese Commanding Commissars is about. There was a view volunteered that it is about how corruption comes about. I suggested then that I think it is much more than that. In fact, this explanation of how corruption comes about is but incidental. There is something larger that it signifies. And I want to suggest to you this evening that what it suggests and signifies is, or are rather, the pitfalls of nationalism. Simply put, the problems of independence that whose birth is midwifed by nationalism. So nationalism, to explain, or perhaps it would help to start by explaining what nationalism is. Nationalism basically is an ideology invented in Europe at a time when Europe was transitioning into the era of modern industrial capitalism. So it is an ideology which assumes that every nation must have a state of its own. It is precisely at this moment in the history of Europe that the state becomes the embodiment or expression of not just the nation but the nation's spirit as well. So when Benedict Anderson claims that the nation is an imagined community, imagined as sovereign and inherently political, this is what he's referring to, to the fact that nations become, or rather states become embodiments of the nation. And as such, the nation cannot be imagined otherwise 
other than political. But as we said, nationalism emerges in and together with modern industrial capitalism. Because it emerges precisely at the time when Europe is transitioning into the modern industrial capitalist era. In fact, nationalism does not only emerge at the same time as the emergence of modern industrial capitalism, but it emerges in and through modern industrial capitalism. Nationalism enables, it is the political vehicle that leads to modern industrial capitalism. And so, nationalism, as I've said, emerges in and together with modern industrial capitalism, which is basically to say that nationalism is a modernist ideology. Its object is to modernize society. So nationalism, together with modernist liberal capitalism, assumes that all societies, everywhere in the world, it assumes that all societies move in a unilinear fashion, beginning from the same originary moment. And that originary moment, they say, is the pre-modern, the pre-capitalist or simple society. So it assumes that all societies in the world begin from the same originary moment and they move in the same direction and that direction leading to the ultimate stage which is to become a modern capitalist state. Or simply put, it is that all societies the world over aspire to become modern. So, if nationalism is the political ideology of modern capitalism, their mutual meeting ground is what we call modernist epistemology or modern thought generally. The mutual meeting point of nationalism and modern industrial capitalism, what joins them together and perhaps gives expression to them is what we call modernist epistemology the kind of knowledge you study at school. And here we're referring to all the disciplines you study at school, be it medicine, be it accounting, every discipline, because there is none of the disciplines we teach and learn in the university that are not integrated or infused with the modern capitalist logic. Ask a good dietitian who you meet, who looks at people every day fattening themselves with debilitating food, he or she looks at them until they are sick and they can come to him or her and he or she would help them simply because they will pay. So the use of our disciplines and our knowledges is itself integrated into the logic of modern capitalism. So that's what we mean when we say modern epistemology is what joins together nationalism and capitalism. It infuses everything with the capitalist logic, with the nationalist logic. Or, if the example of the dietitian doesn't quite help, you can only think of a doctor who again watches a neighbor, a neighbor's health go down and cannot say or do anything or advise until the neighbor is sick and has become a client. We call them patients. And so the use of the doctor's knowledge is not to heal people. It is to make money. So there is an integration and that integration is not incidental. It is not as a result of individual volitions. It is as a result of the transition in Europe from the pre-modern to the modern era, wherein you have the joining together of nationalism on the one hand and capitalism on the other, and they are joined together by what we call 
modernist epistemology. So, modernist epistemology is basically that order of knowledge predicated on reason and rationality. But what is the problem with this order of knowledge for us on this side of history and on this side of the planet or as African people? It is that this order of knowledge called modernist epistemology projects itself as universally valid. It projects itself as transcultural, as transhistorical, which is simply to say that its validity is not in any way limited by cultural and historical boundaries. If you want to know, or if you want an example of it, you can only look at a European arriving at a country or at a society he has never been, and I'm saying he deliberately because this is typical of a white male mediocre. You need to only look at a white man arriving at a society just descending on the staircase of an aeroplane. He doesn't speak the language of that society, does not know the culture of that society, but already at that moment, as soon as the doors of the plane open, he already has an authoritative view to volunteer about what is wrong in that society. Because he's possessed of a kind of knowledge that assumes itself to be universal, that assumes itself to be transcultural and transhistorical, and so it does not even wait to learn the language, can already tell you what is the problem with South Africa, arriving a minute ago. So the problem with this order of knowledge is that it projects itself as universally valid, as transcultural, or as transhistorical. It is assume, or rather it assumes primacy over all other forms of knowledge and all other kinds of societal values and all other kinds of societal organization. And so we assume that every society politically must be organized along liberal democratic lines. Because we assume this to be the universal norm. So lastly, modernist epistemology arrogates unto itself the right to decide what is normatively permissible. In fact, it not only decides what is normatively permissible, it makes itself, it declares itself the norm. And so I meet people all the time who tell me that I must be reasonable and I must be rational. And then I respond to them that, but reason and rationality are white. And so when you invite me to be reasonable and to be rational, you are inviting me to be white. So, <clears throat> the problem with the modernist epistemology is that it arrogates unto itself the right to decide what is normatively permissible or, in fact, it turns itself into a norm. We will answer along the way. So anything or any society or any person who moves away from this norm is judged to be irrational, to be abnormal, or to be unreasonable. So just in case the point is not clear enough, what I'm trying to say is that nationalism shares with capitalism the same moral order which is to say nationalism is inherently capitalist. More specifically, nationalism is inherently liberal capitalist. This is the ideology I've spent all of this time to be able to make just this one point, which is that this is the ideology of nationalism that was imported wholesale to Africa by nationalist movements and the nationalist elite 
that led to the struggle for independence. And so, this ideology of nationalism, as we've outlined it, is what is imported wholesale to Africa by the nationalist movements and the nationalist elite. It is mainly for this reason that Chataji, an Indian scholar, claims that nationalism in the non-Western world, particularly in Africa, is in this instance a work of mimicry. There is nothing original about the nationalist elite in Africa. All it did was to take or was to adopt a European ideology wholesale and make it its own. In fact, it did not end at adopting the ideology and making it its own. It actually sought to defend that ideology. So, if that's too far off, or it sounds like a distant past, I would invite you, when you have an opportunity, to look around the elite in South Africa today. Look at its values, look at its sensibilities, look at its preferences. There's nothing original about it. Its clothing, its preference for the kind of fashion and everything else is borrowed from Europe. So, when we say that the nationalist elite is, there's nothing original about it and in its thought, it's not only the nationalist elite of old, but it is the present nationalist elite also, or the present elite in South Africa, that suffers from the same limitation, which is basically the lack of authenticity. So because the nationalist elite that leads Africa to independence had no original conception of society, had no conception, original conception of values, what it did rather was to accept as its own Western modernist values, was to accept as its own modernist tastes, was to accept as its own modern epistemology, modernist sensibilities, and the modern political organization of society. You only have to look at how we teach each other in the presence of this elite when they tell you about the virtues of a single and a double malt, whiskey, and all of those things, as if they ever originated the idea. And so people become masters of things they did not conceptualize or whose conception they were not present. So, the nationalist elite, as I said, accepted as its own these Western modernist values. So that my point is not lost to you when I say the modernist elite accepted these modernist values, modernist taste and modern epistemology. All I'm essentially saying is that it accepted capitalist values. It accepted capitalist tastes. It also accepted the liberal capitalist epistemology as its own. Thus, when nationalism crosses the Atlantic from America to Africa and crosses the Mediterranean from Europe into Africa and becomes African nationalism, its object was not to create a new society in Africa. Its object rather was to turn Africa into a mirror image of the West. At this point, we're coming closer to what those who have had the fortune of seeing the show and those who are going to see it this evening will understand, we're coming closer to them understanding what exactly the show tells us about the sensibilities of the nationalist elite. What it portrays is not just corruption. What it portrays is what life becomes like in any post-colonial society 
where independence comes via nationalism as an ideology and via the nationalist elite as the agents of that independence. And this is not peculiar to South Africa. What we are going to see in the show is not peculiar to South Africa, as I'm going to explain in a moment. So to reiterate, when nationalism crosses the Atlantic from America to Africa and the Mediterranean from Europe to Africa and becomes African nationalism, its object was not to create any new society in Africa, but rather to turn Africa into a mirror image of the West. However, for that to happen, colonialism first had to be defeated. So what African nationalists disagreed with was not the model of society that colonialism had instituted in Africa. What the nationalists disagreed with, as I've said, was not the model of society that colonialism had instituted in Africa, but rather the fact that the white colonialists the white settler colonizers had arrogated unto themselves the right and responsibility to modernize African societies. And for the nationalist elite, this right or responsibility was legitimately theirs and exclusively theirs. So between the nationalist and the colonialist, there is agreement. They agree on the image of society that is to be built. The nationalists have no problem with the model of society that the, that the colonialists have instituted, which is a modern society. What they disagree on is who has a right to institute that model. So, so, the problem of nationalism and the problem of independence delivered through nationalism is simply the fact that what nationalism basically aspires, aspired towards was the displacement of the colonialists and their replacement with the nationalist elite and everything continues as it was. Because they agreed on the model of society. So it is precisely for this lack of originality that Fanon criticizes the nationalist elite in Africa. Again, for those of you who've seen the show and those of you who are going to see the show, who are yet to see the show, you would see the quotation or rather the reading that the show begins with or the play begins with from Fanon where he basically riles against the inauthenticity or lack of originality of the nationalist elite or what he calls the nationalist bourgeois. So, Fanon, in his book, in a chapter titled The Pitfalls of Nationalist Consciousness, he writes about this nationalist elite, which he calls the nationalist bourgeoisie. And this is what he says. The nationalist bourgeois, which takes over power at the end of the colonial regime, is an underdeveloped bourgeois. He continues to describe this bourgeois in the following terms. And I want to quote from Fanon, how he describes this bourgeois. He says, its economic clout is practically zero. This national bourgeoisie professes or rather possesses neither industrialists or financiers. The nationalist bourgeois in the underdeveloped countries is not geared to production invention, creation, or work. All its energy is channeled into intermediary activities. 
It basically serves as a go-between. All its energy is channeled into intermediary activities. Networking and scheming seems to be its underlying vocation. The economy, he continues, has always developed outside of their control. As for the present and potential resources of the country's soil and subsoil, their knowledge is purely academic and approximate. They can only talk about them in general terms and abstract terms. After independence, this underdeveloped bourgeois stagnates miserably. Now, I do want to remind you that it is 1963 when Fanon pens these words. The play we are about to see, for those who are going to see it, or the play we have seen, was written in 2018. So this must sound as good as prophetic for Fanon to have foreseen basically where South Africa is in 2023, in 1963. Because I do want you, if you've watched the show, to remind yourself whether there is any moment in the show where the nationalist elite that is being portrayed in the show, where at any moment this elite is talking about work, productive work. <laughs> or where there is any moment in the show where this nationalist elite, whose character is being portrayed, where it gives you a sense that it knows exactly what are the country's resources, both on its soil and in its subsoil, or it talks about them in an abstract and general way. Because to know what those resources are, and to know them not in a general and abstract way, would have led us to ask whether we have the intellectual capability to mine these resources on our own. But nonetheless, I want to enjoin you to watch the show or to remind yourselves of the show with this paragraph we've read from Fanon about the bourgeois that whose lives is not geared to production or to invention or to work. In fact, its lives is geared to networking, to scheming, and to consumption. At every moment, it consumes and consumes what it doesn't produce. For any good observer of society, by now, there is something that we would have observed and put a stop to as a country in South Africa, which is that the international alcohol industry has basically made South Africa an experimental market. Every new product that needs, or old product that needs a new market or that needs reviving, you introduce it in South Africa around December. <laughs> this is why Fanon says the nationalist elite only talks about things in a general and abstract sense. It does not have a knowledge of society. You must watch when the play comes on later this evening how many times they toast to whiskey. <laughs> it is not accidental. It is in the character of the nationalist elite. So the reason I'm reminding you that it is 1963 when Fanon pens these words, it is because I want to enjoin even those who have watched the play to watch it again after this talk against the backdrop of the near prophetic words 
that Fanon left us with in 1963. When you do watch the play, <clears throat> again, I enjoin you to search for any sign in need where the nationalist elite is concerned, as I've said, with productive work. I invite you to watch keenly to see if it has any work ethic or if its life is the life of leisure. Again, I invite you to search as you watch the play again whether anywhere in the discussions of in it, or rather whether anywhere in its discussions this nationalist elite is seized with the question of what it would mean to organize society and the state on the basis of a new program of social relations. And it, you were to find that that new model of society, of organizing society on the basis of a new program of social relations, one of the things you would find is that human relations in this society led by the nationalist elite are basically governed by the logic of economic rationality. What would my relationship with you benefit me? Lastly, I enjoin you to listen carefully to the language of the play and to the language of the nationalist elite and hear it when it talks about or talks of the people. And these, by the way, are the people it supposedly leads. Look for any sign of condescension in the way they talk about the people. There is nowhere in the play or in the language of the play where the people who this nationalist elite leads are spoken about in any positive sense. It is that their poverty must be avoided by all means by the elite. So you must avoid the life of Amazenke. <laughs> Skiki. <laughs> so if you find yourself, as I suspect you will, affirming all of the negative attributes that I have just highlighted of the, of the nationalist elite, the question must be then, how did we in South Africa follow the same path Fanon had predicted in 1963? How did it happen that what Fanon had forewarned us about the pitfalls of nationalism in 1963 came to be the reality or came to fruition in South Africa in 2023? I think that's the most fundamental question that the play is inviting us to answer. Otherwise, the play is going to be nothing but something for the excitement of our sensibilities in the eye. If it doesn't enjoin us to answer that question as to how did we, or why did we not learn, not only from Fanon, but also from the experiences of other African states whose independence was just like our own, mediated by nationalism and the nationalist elite. Many of these African states gained their independence in the 1960s. And so we saw their trajectory. We saw precisely the things that are today being portrayed in Congolese commanding commissars. All the other African states that came before us in the community of independent African states were there for us as a warning. How did we miss it? I think there are two ways of answering the question as to why did we not learn from Fanon, but also from the experiences 
of other African states. One way of answering the question would be to defer to structuralist analysis and claim that the objective material conditions determine a priori the bounds of the possible and the impossible. Which is basically to say that in another way, put in another way, man makes history but not under conditions of his or her own choosing. And so we hear all the time these nationalist elites tell us that we do not understand the material conditions make it impossible for them to do the things that we want them to do. There is truth in the fact that structure limits what is possible. And so they are not wrong in suggesting to us that the objective material conditions do determine a priori the bounds of the possible and the impossible. In this way, we would see that the source of the problem, once we realize that the problem is structural, it's not with individuals or with individual personalities, in this way, we would see that the source of the problem is not the ANC, but the source of the problem is independence delivered through nationalism. Or, if you prefer, all of these problems are not of the ANC's making, but these are mere manifestations of the pitfalls of nationalism. Because the character of the ANC or the nationalist elite in South Africa is not different from the character of the nationalist elite everywhere else in the continent. That is why Fanon does not say the nationalist bourgeois in Kenya is underdeveloped. He says the nationalist bourgeois that takes over power after independence is underdeveloped. In fact, somewhere in the text he continues to say that it is also underdeveloped intellectually. So, if you were to answer this question that we posed as to why did we follow the same route down the pit when we had the examples of other African states that should have served as a warning for us, or why did we not from Fanon? If you use a structuralist analysis, you would see that the problem is bigger than individuals. That is why I implore you, if you remove one ANC president and put another, whether it is Ramaphosa, whether it is Zuma, whether it is Tabo, the problems are the same. The country remains underdeveloped because the problem is not those individuals. The problem is nationalism or independence delivered through nationalism. So, as I've said, the structuralist analysis enables us to move away from individuals. But there is yet another way of answering the question, which would be, which would be rather to return to the ANC its agency and say, even though the structure had predetermined the route for you, you could as well have elected to refuse that route. And so if we restore the agency to the nationalist elite, it ought then to be able to say, these are the objective conditions that are structurally determining the path of post-colonial reform, but we are going to consciously work against these objective material conditions in order that we don't follow the same path down to the nether world. So, neither of, neither of these two, in my estimates, the structuralist analysis and the one that says, yes, Congo Lose could have opted for a different option, I suspect that neither of these helps us adequately on its own answer the question at hand. In order to arrive at an alternative explanation, 
other than the structuralist analysis and the one that venerates the agency of the ANC or the nationalist elite, I want to suggest something else. And by the way, again, these are not problems that or these problems at this moment sound like they are too far off from us. There's something very odd I hear every day in South Africa. People say you can be whatever you want to be. I mean, please, don't, don't, don't mislead people. And if people could be whatever they want to be, I mean, the world would be a different place. But it's the same thing for the nationalist elite. When you say they have an option, you are saying they should be different, or rather they should be different from what they are. But my intent in these last few minutes is to suggest to you a different explanation. And in order to arrive at that explanation, I'm going to suggest the following. One, it is that it is indeed true that nationalism as a bourgeois borrowed paradigm limits the possibilities of what can be done or structurally determines from ab initio the possibilities for post-colonial reform. So I want to accept that indeed nationalism does impose some structural limitations as a borrowed paradigm and it imposes these structural limitations from ab initio even before you have begun. The structure is already there. So that is why it's a fairy tale to say to people you can be what you want. Because there is a structural world out there that already determines what is doable and what is not doable. So if you want to be whatever you want to be, go walk in downtown Joburg anytime. I care you want to be whatever you want to be. The objective conditions determine what is possible and what is not possible. So it is indeed true that nationalism, I want to suggest to you, as a borrowed paradigm, limits the possibilities of what can be done or structurally determines from ab initio the possibilities for post-colonial reform. But it is equally true, too, it is equally true that the benefit of hindsight with the benefit of hindsight, the ANC or Congo Lose could have consciously sought to avoid the path the other African states followed. But it elected not to learn from the other comparative post-colonial African states, neither did it learn from Fanon's prognosis. Why? I think is what needs to be explained. Why did the nationalist elite that we are going to see portrayed in the play tonight, why did it not opt for a different route using the benefit of hindsight of the other African states? Because remember, one of the benefits, unintended benefits that we had in South Africa is that we were the last country to gain independence in the continent. So by 1994, basically, other than the Saharawi Republic, which is, you know, dominated by Morocco, we basically were the last country to be under colonial rule, and therefore we were the last country to gain independence. So we had the rest of the continent to learn from. The question is, why did we not learn? Why did the nationalist elite did not learn from this experience of other African states. I'm happy to hazard one explanation for this as to why the nationalist elite failed, or maybe did not fail, but elected not to learn from both Fanon's prognosis and from the historical experience of other post-colonial African states. Imagine if the play were to seize us at some moment with a discussion amongst the nationalist elite as to what is the model of society that we want to build. 
It does not happen anywhere that there is a moment where this nationalist elite is concerned with society or with the model of society. The question must be, why did it not learn, or why did it turn a blind eye, or why did it elect not to learn from Fanon's prognosis and from the historical experience, as I've said, of other post-colonial African states? What I want to suggest to you is that Fanon's prognosis was not an outcome of a prophecy. Fanon was not a prophet. But the question must be, how come could he predict with such precision in 1963 what would be the life of post-colonial African states? It was not a prophecy. It was not an invocation of religious spirits. But rather, Fanon's prognosis was a product, was a culmination of a scientific theoretical practice. It was a culmination of a rigorous practice or a rigorous exercise of scientific theoretical practice. More specifically, it was a product, Fanon's prophecy was a product of that part of a scientific theoretical practice that enables the transformation of a general difficulty into a scientific problem. So Fanon was able to correctly read what would be the trajectory of post-colonial African states by basically elevating an everyday general problem into a scientific problem. This is why you must run away when you hear on radio, very much in this SAFM, F Metro FM, uh, and all that type. You hear people say, for me, this is the problem. <laughs> The world does not obey your laws. I mean, there's nothing in the world, when you said for me, there's nothing in the world that obeys your instructions as an individual. Even your emotions do not obey your instructions. Because what do you do when you say for me, so if we have 45 million or, I mean, 50-something uh, million South Africans, and we all said, for me, the problem is this. We had 55 million views of what the problem is. When you go to a doctor, the doctor doesn't say, for me, <laughs> you look like you have cancer. The doctor says to you, on the basis of my examination of your general problems, my prognosis is that you have cancer. And the doctor, a good doctor, says to you, that's a prognosis I've arrived at. It can be repeated by any other doctor. Go and ask any other doctor. That's what scientific practice means. Not people's individual predilections. What Fanon did is repeatable by other people through a method I've called scientific theoretical practice, but particularly that part of scientific theoretical practice that enables the elevation of an empirical problem into a theoretical or a scientific problem. So it's not helpful. There is another figure that is to be abad in South African society today, which is the figure of the political analyst. Every day, those people who are basically products of bourgeois press, hoping to one day become celebrities, every day they pummel us with empirical enumerations of the problems. There is corruption, there is a problem of service delivery. Those are empirical manifestations of a larger problem. What is the larger problem? 
We want to know what is the larger problem so that we can resolve the larger problem once and for all so that these empirical manifestations do not occupy our time. So yesterday it was state capture, today it is service delivery, the other day it's something else. And we are told that these are people who are schooled. <laughs> so, in all of this, what I want to suggest to you is that Fanon's prognosis was not an outcome of a prophecy. Rather, it was a product of a scientific theoretical practice. More specifically, that part of a scientific theoretical practice that enables the transformation or elevation of a general everyday problem into a scientific problem. What unfortunately happened to Congo Lose at the moment of independence, and this is my thesis as to why they did not learn from other post-colonial African states. What unfortunately happened to Congo Lose at the moment of independence was an onset of a tendency or a conviction that the historical mission of undoing colonialism could be achieved through bourgeois pragmatism rather than through the art of scientific theoretical practice. What is bourgeois pragmatism? It is the supposition that we have a problem of racism in South Africa today and you have two hardened positions and you think that every problem, every problem you can solve through pragmatism. You have two positions. One side is demanding 2,500 rand salary increment. The state is saying we can only afford 1,500 and then you say let's find the middle ground and continue. That's what bourgeois pragmatism does. It does not go back to ask what is the source of the problem? What is the larger problem that we are faced with? Because what we may be resolving through bourgeois pragmatism may be a manifestation of a larger problem. And so, at the moment of independence, Kongolose began to assume there was an onset of a conviction or a tendency that you can resolve the problems of settler colonialism or you can end the problems of colonialism by muddling your way through using bourgeois pragmatism. Basically, bourgeois pragmatism means muddling your way through. You have no position. At whatever particular point, what is the problem? Let's find the solution and move on. You are the ANC, you've always you know, deployed the DA, but then when coalition agreements have to be signed, you say, no, well, we would sign a coalition agreement with the DA, it's fine. That's bourgeois pragmatism. It is not guided by any principle. Or, in reverse, so, to save time, the point I'm making is that from 1994 onwards, at the moment of independence, Unfortunately for Ukongolose, there was an onset within it of this tendency of supposing that colonialism could be defeated through bourgeois pragmatism rather than through the art of scientific theoretical practice. Now look at it. If you read Fanon, Fanon is nowhere concerned with corruption. Of course, he had seen corruption in many societies that had already gained independence. But he did not preoccupy himself by explaining corruption. He said, what are the objective conditions? What is the larger problem that leads to corruption? And that's how he arrived at his prognosis. So, my suggestion to you is that there is no true liberation for the black colonized or there is no possibility for liberation for the black colonized without a consistent investment in revolutionary scientific theoretical practice. The, that revolutionary 
<coughs> scientific theoretical practice means that cultural productions, such as Congolese commanding commissars, have to appear not by accident. They have to be a product not of one inspired individual. Such cultural productions have to appear not by accident, just as it is that they don't have to be avoided like a plague when they have, when they have appeared. I get a sense that in the state where bourgeois pragmatism rules, such cultural productions are not considered to be integral to the debate that must go on in society. So when they've appeared, as I've said, they are avoided like a plague. So rather, I want to suggest to you that these kinds of cultural productions have to be part of a deliberate or conscious effort to guide and propel society's movement on the basis of a scientific theoretical practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the language of my own personal intellectualism, I only have three things to say. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> uh, but honestly, thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much for sharing such rich and refreshingly and very provocative critical insight with us tonight. Um, gratitude is truly an understatement. And thank you to each of you, our distinguished members, for being in attendance tonight.